Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, so thank you all for coming. Uh, I realise I'm up against HashiCorp, so it's quite a good turnout. Uh, first of all, if any of you would like to follow the slides along on your device or, or just later on take a look at the slides, then you can, you can follow that link. So we'll kick off. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm not a rock star or a ninja, and uh, depending on who you ask, you might find that I'm a software engineer. Uh, you're welcome to follow this link if you'd like to, to connect with me. And uh, there aren't too many Miles McDonald's, so if you, if you punch that into the web, you'll find me hanging out in all the, all the usual places. So I've been uh, getting paid to write software for probably 18 years now. The first part of my career was spent very firmly in, in .NET world. I guess over the last five or six years, I've moved outside of that, uh, namely Erlang, uh, and most recently Go. So uh, last year was the first time I had an opportunity to use Go in production. I was running a small team uh, for a med tech in Oxford, and we'd inherited um, a system which was implemented using a microservice architecture, in which all the services were Node.js, um, which is fine. Node.js is a great tool. Personally, I think it's a little overused. Uh, we had a new requirement come in that required a new uh, back-end service, and it felt like a very good use case for Go. Um, so we, we jumped on that. But of course, in order to do that, we needed to establish a process uh, and a tool chain uh, to use with Go. So taking a look at what was out there, I found Swagger. So uh, just a quick show of hands. How many people are familiar with or have even used Swagger? Great. OK. You probably know more about than I do. Um, <laughs> So uh, what is Swagger? Well, let's just take a look at the website and see what that tells us. At the heart of Swagger is an interface definition language. So it's a, it's a JSON file in which you can specify uh, your interface without the implementation, you know, the what of the interface, what the contract is. And there's an ecosystem of tools around that. So there's, there's an online editor, which I guess is an IDE. Uh, there's a collection of code generation tools, so you can generate client libraries and server templates. Um, and there's a UI, Swagger UI, uh, which is quite useful um, for navigating, debugging, working with, and looking at documentation around the service written in Swagger. Um, Go Swagger is, is written in Go, and it is the code generation piece for Go, so you can create uh, server templates and client libraries. Um, it's worth mentioning the server templates don't use any of the popular frameworks. They use core Go libraries, which is quite nice because you can then use all of the other um, standard web type libraries and packages out there, namely middleware. So let's take a, a closer look at, uh, I don't know how well you can see that. But, um, so what's the, what's, the, what's the value of, of using an interface definition language? Well, it enables you to think about your contract with your API before you get bogged down with the details of implementing it. From there, as I've mentioned, you can generate client libraries, server templates. You can share that spec with consumers or potential consumers. Um, and then you can use that to drive other tools in the tool chain or derive documentation and so on. So another quick look at the tools there. So Swagger Hub is a commercial a product, which is an aggregate of the other tools we've mentioned, the UI, the code gen, and the editor. And Go Swagger um, sits outside of that open source project uh, for client library and server template generation. So let's take a look at Swagger UI. And here it is. So this is the online demo. Um, they've got a demo application, which is a pet store. Uh, and we've loaded up the, the spec, which is the, the JSON just there. And there we go. We can navigate and take a look and see there are a number of routes on pet. And as you would expect to see, we can post a pet, get pets, and so on, update pets, um, interact with the store, interact with the user. And, and this, this UI actually lets us actually invoke uh, roots. So let's try that. Let's try it out. Great. So we got the response we expected. We can see the headers. And another useful feature here, it actually gives us the curl command. So that's a nice little time save. Uh, you can work with this. And then you can go and take those curl commands off and, and do some automation if you wanted to do that. OK, so that's Swagger and Go Swagger. So I'm going to run some uh, interactive demonstration as we go through. So before we get on to that, I'd just like to share with you uh, the components of the development environment. So we happen to be using the latest version of Go, 183. 
uh, the latest version of Swagger, which is 011, uh, which would suggest it's not production ready by the version numbers. I've had a service running in production for um, 12 months or so now and not had any problems, so I would consider it production ready. I will caveat with the fact that it hasn't been uh, tested against an incredibly high load, um, but a, a moderate amount of load and it not had any problems. Uh, I'm a JetBrains fan, so I'm going to use Gogland IDE. Um, package management, as uh, Steve mentioned in the keynote, package management, as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, is considered somewhat weak uh, in Go. I'm using Glide here. Glide has been absolutely fine in this use case. I'm also using Node.js uh, for part of the tool chain, and I'll, I'll explain why later on. And we're also going to do some uh, demonstration with Docker when, he come, when we come to the packaging and deployment of the service. Uh, most, or it's maybe a 50-50 split of what I'm going to present is Go-specific, and then around the packaging and deployment, those things are kind of generic, not necessarily Go-specific, but um, hopefully you'll see the value in looking at those things too. So that's the development environment. So let's have a look at the build. So first of all, what is the what, what we're going to look at? So I've got a somewhat contrived, although I think fairly useful, demonstration application. Um, we're going to have an API which fronts for any number of email services at the back end. So you can send an email to this API, and then it will send your email on via one of the services. And the API has a circuit breaker pattern in there. Um, you may and may not be familiar. Who's familiar with the circuit breaker pattern? OK, a reasonable amount of you. So I'll just quickly summarize that. Um, circuit breaker, the idea is that you fail fast and you're, you're resilient. So um, circuit breaker will detect when there's a failure, when it sends a message, either as a timeout or an explicit failure, and then it will open that circuit. Uh, the circuit breaker implementation in this application will then poll that circuit until it considers it's closed again, and then we'll continue to route traffic. Um, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, the code for this is online, so you can follow that link, and you can take a look at the code. It's got the build scripts and all the tooling there. Cool, so what's the first thing we need to do? Well, we need to write our, um, our Swagger spec. But what we don't want to do is work with a single file. You can imagine APIs get quite large in terms of the number of routes and models. And working with a single JSON file would be very difficult. How many of us have you know, forgot how many curly brackets we're in? And it becomes a nightmare. So what we've got here is a very nice uh, model for splitting up that specification into separate YAML files aligned with routes and models. And then using the tool chain, we can just aggregate that back into a single file, which we can then use to drive the rest of the tool chain. So let's have a look at that. Okay, so here's the spec. So at the root of the spec, can everyone see that? Okay, good. So at the root of the spec, we've got a, a title. Um, it produces and consumes JSON. It serves over HTTP. Uh, we've got a global security definition in there. So in order to interact with most of the routes, you'll need to use an API key. And then we go on to refer to the definitions and the paths, or to use other vocabulary, the, uh, the models and the routes. So let's have a look at that. What do we have under routes or paths? Well, as is sensible, we have a health check route. If everything's OK, we'll get back a 200 from that. If there's an issue, then we'll get back the default response, which would typically be a 500, along with some text uh, that give us a description of what the problem is. So we see they were referring to an error message definition. Let's go and have a look at that. And it's just an object with a, with a, a message string. The other route we have is for sending an email. So if we just quickly look back at Health Check, you'll see there's no security declaration on that. That's open shop. Anyone can ping Health Check. But if you want to send an email, then you'll need to include uh, the API key in the header, uh, in the body of the post. So obviously it's a post. In the body of the post, you'll pass an email, which looks like that. Um, I haven't, this service, implemented the full functionality to get from SMTP. So it's just single recipient, no attachments, and so on. Uh, which is fine for demo purposes. And it will normally respond with a 200. If you don't provide an API key or the API key is wrong, you'll get back a 401. And if there's a problem, you'll get back a 500 um, with that same model we looked at earlier, which is the error message. So that's our spec. So let's take a look. I've got some scripts here. Let's have a look at Swagger code gen. So how do we turn that spec into the server template, and the client libraries that we're going to use for functional testing later on. So the first thing we do is we run the JSON refs. This is the Node.js tool. 
and this will um, stitch together all those YAMLs and output a JSON file. We'll then do some cleanup and clean up the autogen code from the last run. We'll then invoke Swagger to uh, generate the server template. We'll then copy back in some code that's got some, some of the autogen code that we've, we've, we've changed that we need to copy back over. And then we'll generate the client from the spec again. So let's run that. Okay, all looks happy. So what has that given us? That's given us the client implementation under there. And it's given us the server template under REST API. Okay. So let's review some of that code and see how this thing hangs together. So, and uh, here we go. So here's the initializer. So configuration comes from the environment. So you can see we're pulling in a number of config keys there, the API key. Um, there's a poll message address. So when, as I said, with circuit breaker, when it needs to poll a service to see when it's back up, it will just use a dummy address, a dummy message. So it's not sending any real traffic to a service which is considered down. Um, we've got the ability to inject a mock email service. So when we run functional testing, we can test the thing end to end but we can mock out the email service dependency. Um, and then there's some things, some things to do with the log output format and then some API keys for the downstream services. Uh, we initialize our logger and we'll look at a bit more detail in that. Obviously logging is critical, um, particularly when you're running multiple services. We bind the routes and so on. Let's take a look here. Okay. So this is more bootstrap code. And uh, this is where we inject our middleware, in fact. So you'll see we've got um, the logger has some middleware for generating a request key. I'll talk about that in a little more detail shortly. Um, we enable cause requests. That's to enable the Swagger UI to work against the, the JSON spec. Um, and then there's an authentication uh, piece of middleware. Uh, this is quite naive in its implementation. It just statically looks and says, are we looking for health check? Okay, let it through, otherwise check the, the API key. Cool, okay, that's the code review. Okay, so logging. Logging's obviously critical. Um, I'm hoping to use a log light. Let's see where that is. Let's go, swag up, bear with me. There we go, Loglight. Okay, so Loglight, um, I wrote Loglight, so uh, it's based on a blog post from Dave Cheney. It's just a very lightweight logging package. I'm sure there's better ones out there, um, but this serves a purpose. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so we can log out JSON one line, um, which is useful in production when you want to aggregate your log output into something like uh, Elasticsearch or maybe Prometheus. We can have JSON pretty, which is nice at development time or we can in fact define in the application a custom uh, log output. We have log event types. I find this very useful because you can actually bind a log entry to a specific line of code. So you know, when uh, support staff need to look after this application, they've got a huge amount of log output. Being able to, to pinpoint in the code where a particular log entry has been originated from is very useful. But something this, so here's, here's the middleware. Now, request key. So if you can imagine we've got um, a large microservice architecture, we've got controllers at the edge, request comes in, the life cycle of that request across the whole architecture may involve end services. It would be nice if once we've aggregated all those logs, we could actually look at, tie that, that log output together for the life cycle of the request across the whole estate. And so the idea is that when the request first comes in, the first service will generate a GUID, attach that as the, as the request key, and then each service should then append that as a header for downstream requests. So this middleware will look for that key on an income request if it exists, hold it for the lifecycle request and so on. So hopefully I've explained that well enough. You can understand that when you then look at all your logs from, from different services, you can stitch it all together. Um, you can look at, uh, if you're outputting timestamps, you can obviously look at latency there, performance and so on. <coughs> 
Okay, so there's logging. So we've built something. Well, obviously, we want to test it. And the first thing we want to do is write some unit tests. So obviously, unit tests run in a single process. Um, the way we've implemented the tests here, we don't test any of the autogen code. We just, we just test the code we've written to implement the application. So we've got some unit tests around the circuit breaker and the email service. So let's take a look at those. Okay, here we go. So we're testing for error, closed, timeout, closed, test open, closed, open, closed. So we're just testing that circuit breaker is doing what it should do when we, when we pass a load of traffic through it. And then for the email service. There we go. So we've got um, test with two services, okay. Test with two services, the first one times out. And, and different kind of edge cases around uh, the performance. If we look at uh, the way I've coded this, we've got uh, we've got an interface for the email service, which is which is just a single method interface, which is send an email message. And um, there are two implementations in here. There's Mailgun. And there's SendGrid, and also there's a mock email service, and they all just have a send method. Um, so that's pretty f straightforward. You could see how easy it would be to include other uh, SMTP providers over time to simply create a new implementation that implements send. So let's run the unit tests. Okay, all good. But that's only part of the story, of course. We want some functional tests. Functional tests will run the tests in one process and then run against an instance of the server running in another. I've actually shown that on the diagram as running um, the API server in a Docker container. In the first instance, we won't do that, so in your development environment. Um, we'll run up the server on the host, no Docker involved. On port 80. There it is. So let's take a look at our functional tests. So we're testing the email route. Can we send an email OK? Uh, what happens when an email times out, an email fails, and so on? And the way we've actually done that, if I show you, so as I say, the server's read all its, all its um, variables from the environment. And we've set SMTP mock email service true there. And if we look at the mock email service, it looks at the message subject and then we'll behave according to that. So if we want a message to cause a timeout, we pass a message with a subject of timeout. So we know that we'll be able to mock the behavior of the downstream service in that fashion. Okay, so the server's running on one terminal. Let's run the unit tests. Sorry, functional tests. Okay, it looks good. And then we can see some, some uh, log output. So we've had an error in the post email, post email end, post email start. You can see there the request key, hopefully. Yeah. And some other information, and obviously a timestamp. Uh, so you can imagine over time, and you have a large body of, of this information, you can start to look at latency over time. You could look at latency on particular nodes because we get the host address. So you can slice and dice this in lots of ways to help you come up with metrics when you're running a larger state. Cool. So we built something. We test it. It works. Wonderful. Where do we go from here? Let's package it up. So um, we're going to package this up as an immutable Docker image. Uh, we're going to follow 12-factor app principles. Who's familiar with 12-factor app? Yeah, a good number of you. Um, I'm actually going to use Alpine Linux as our base distro as well, and I'll talk about that. So I've just picked out seven of the 12-factor app principles that are worth bringing up during this talk. So code base, have a single repo for a service. Well, we do. Um, be explicit about your dependencies. We're using Glide. So let me just show you Glide. If you're not, who's familiar with Glide? 
Yeah, again, with a few of you. So, um, for those of you familiar with NPM or perhaps uh, Nugget in C Sharp, it's the same deal. You have a file which specifies what your dependencies are and what the versions are. So, here we go. Here's our dependencies. And then we've got a lock file that actually locks these into a specific commit hash. So we can have a repeatable build. Um, without this, we might be subject to updates being inadvertently brought in, and obviously that can break things. So we're very specific about our dependencies. Uh, config should come from the environment. Well, it does, as you've seen, it reads all of its config from the environment. Execute as one or more stateless processes. Um, there's actually a caveat on this. There is some state in the circuit breaker. There's no other state, but there is state in the circuit breaker as to which circuits are open and closed. But actually, it's better to have that isolated than shared because routes may be open or closed differently depending on where the node is. So network conditions, a route may be open from one node and not another. So we do have some isolated state. That's actually desirable in this example. Um, export services via port binding. We do, it's a HTTP server. Um, disposability, fast startup and graceful shutdown. It is very fast to start up. Actually, then I haven't looked into what the, the, the shutdown deal is with Ghostwagger, so perhaps some work to do there to confirm that we're actually um, on message with graceful shutdown. And treat logs as event streams, where we do logging is all just a standard out, and, and it's a time series, effectively. So why use the Alpine Linux distribution? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a very stripped-down uh, distro. It's very small. It runs very little uh, packages and services. So you have a reduced attack service. Um, you have a reduced RAM footprint. It uses less memory than, than, than a larger distro. And typically, uh, with a Ghostwagger server, you get your, you'll get your Docker image down to about 40 megabytes. Uh, if you're using full-blown Ubuntu, you're probably in the 600 megabytes plus. So that's an advantage. Okay, now finally, I seem to have steamed through that, so we're coming up a little short, but I'm sure there'll be questions. Um, deployment, so a typical setup might be this. So obviously you'll have source control. Um, you'll probably have a build server. I've used Circle CI to great effect, but I'm sure you'll have used Jenkins, Team City, and others. Um, in this scenario, the, the output from the build server is a Docker image, which will be published to an image repo. Then you'll have some kind of deployment agent. So I'm going to run a, dip, a, a demo now. Well, I'll, I'll be the deployment agent manually, but you could have some other automated piece. Um, something I've seen work very well in the past is to run Hubot and to invoke scripts via Slack via a secure channel, um, which, works small, which works well in a small scenario. But obviously in larger organizations, you probably want more automation. And then the typical setup is we'll run N instances of the service behind a load balancer, and then we'll use something like Mesos or Kubernetes maybe, or Nobad, in order to, to manage um, those instances. So, so what's going to happen? We're going to run a build from source control. If that's all good, and the build's obviously going to run unit tests, it's going to build our Docker image. It's then going to fire up the Docker image and run the functional tests against that. And that's an important distinction. To run the functional tests against the container, rather than just firing up the server from the command line, because then you're testing what you're actually proposing to deploy. So if that's all good, we'll push that to the image repo, and then we'll instruct whatever's running our estate to actually do a deploy. So I'm going to run that on my machine. Let's see how we go. So we'll kill that server. And first of all, let's build the Docker image. What this actually does is it fires up, in fact, we'll look at that script while it's running. So what we do here is we pull the, we pull the Golang 183 Alpine, Alpine 3.6 image. So that's Alpine with the Go tools. We map a volume there back to our source. We then run the build to create the binary. We then pull the binary out. And we then, we then do a Docker build. And I'll show you the Docker file there. Just from Alpine, so no go, no go tools now. And then we just inject our compiled binary into Alpine. So the, the Docker image that we end up with doesn't have the go tools on it. It just has our, our binary, which is the most efficient way to do it in terms of space. Okay, so we've built that. So now let's do the job of the build server. Let's actually run up that container. 
In fact, before I do that, let's just check that it is in fact Yep, it's 80. Now you'll see that's quite old. That's because I haven't changed the code. So because I haven't changed the code, I haven't changed the binary, so Docker has recognized that and hasn't actually created a new Docker image, but trust me, it's the same thing. Trust me, I'm a software engineer. So, <laughs> there's no smoke and mirrors here. This is all genuine. Uh, so let's fire that up. And you can see I've passed in the environment variables on the Docker command line there. Okay, so that's running. So let's run the same unit tests. Uh, sorry, functional tests. Functional tests, all good. Yes, they hit the server. There's the same build output. Great. So let's push that up to our image repository. I'm just using public uh, Docker Hub. So let's take a look at that. There we go. There's our send mail service proxy. Several versions on there a day ago, so that's me testing out. This all works last night. So now let's go into deployment agent mode. Now I'm using, uh, to simulate the your production infrastructure, Kubernetes or whatever, I'm actually using Podspace. Podspace is Kubernetes and OpenShift as a service, so it's incredibly easy to go in there, create an application. Uh, here we can see I've got two, <coughs> two instances running of the SendMail service proxy. Uh, I've set up a root. This is effectively our load balancer. I've secured that with my SSL. So let's do an update. Let's ask that to deploy. Okay, so that's busy deploying. So that will bring down one at a time each of those instances, pull in the latest Docker image, and bring each of those up. So while that's doing that, let's hit the health check endpoint. Okay, so this will hit, as you can see, send mail service proxy on my domain. We'll hit the, we do a get request against the health check. Tense moments. Still thinking about doing that deploy. Okay. Maybe that's a deploy issue. Cool. Okay. So we've gone wrong at that stage. I was hoping to show you was that deployment complete, hit the health check, and then uh, I just put a static command line here so that we could actually send, send an email through the service. So this is using the same client libraries as we're using for the, for the functional tests. Boom, okay, we're back in business. So we've got a, <laughs> so great, we've got a 200. No, it's still wobbly. Okay, so send your support request to Podspace on that. Let's try and send an email. Who knows, it might work. I wouldn't mind betting that's probably halfway through. Oh, there we go, so maybe they both just came up. No, okay, so some flakiness around that. Oh, we look good. Email. No. Ah, oh, yeah, there we go. So let's just check that came through. Okay, there we go. So obviously I've... Software developer sends email from page news. <laughs> That's probably the longest way you can send an email. Um, so, okay, so 30 minutes there. I've flown, flown through quite a lot. Hopefully, 
uh, there's been something in there that's new to you or something, something you might find useful. Um, we certainly found that quite an effective process. And uh, yeah, we were quite happy with it. So any questions? Hello. Do you have any tips for using Swagger to generate an API where the different parts of the API are implemented in different microservices? That's a good question. Different parts of the API. Sure, so I think what you do, so this is, I haven't done this, but I think that's pretty straightforward. So you'd have a top level specification and then you just route, you'd have something in front of the services routing the traffic accordingly. So if you had a service on the end of, I don't know, to go to the pet store application, something for pets, something to store, you could run those as separate services on the end of those uh, subdomains and then just route from the load balancer, I guess, Nginx or, or whatever. So yeah, I think that'd be pretty straightforward. Any other questions? Hi. So in Java, you can use the Swagger UI and just annotations, and then uh, Swagger UI automatically generates uh, this nice uh, UI for you. Yeah. Um, is there something similar um, instead of going the whole nine yards with writing down the spec, generating all the stuff? So on, only the last part? Sorry, run that by me again. So, so instead of going through the whole generation part, is there some way to just get the UI part for an existing API you hand wrote, for example? So if you wanted to use this tool against an existing service, you mean? And generate only the UI part for other developers, for example, to use oh, the API. Oh, I see. Yes, absolutely. Well, you can, just from the spec, you, could, you can use this tool. I mean, if there was no service on the end of it, of course, you couldn't use the interaction. Okay. Have I answered? I'm not quite. <laughs> I don't want to go through all the, the steps writing on the spec. I just want to add the UI part um, at the end. So, yeah. How could you, how could you add the UI without the spec? I'm not sure. Well, I'm in not the sure Java world, you just add annotations to your REST con controllers. Oh, I see. So that you go the other way around, and actually you build your service, and then you generate the spec from the service. Yeah, I think that's what you're saying. And, and yes, there are. In fact, there's a lot of tools out there that do exactly that. Um, I'm certainly looking at some in .NET world. So yeah, you go ahead, use Web API, build your API, annotate that with um, attributes, and then you can generate the spec from there. So you can go code first to generate spec to drive the tool chain. Or, as we have done in this example, we can go spec first and then generate the template and, and go, go with the tool train that way. So, cool. I think we got there in the end. Thank you. Any more? No? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming.